energized crowd. It's, it's really good to see all you great patriots out here. I know there's uh, some people in the crowd who don't like me, but you know that's fine. We have a right uh, to peacefully protest. So I just want to say thank you guys for coming out here. I'm really excited to talk about campus carry and my story a little bit. But let's go ahead and dive a little bit into campus carry. Here at Kent State, there are a lot of people out here who have who have legitimate fears. There's young women out here specifically who are targets of sexual assault or kidnapping, and they live in the dormitories. I was reading a couple articles today. You know that these young women aren't allowed to protect themselves here? The university just doesn't care. Your lawmakers, they don't care. And I think that's, I don't think that's okay. I think young women, young men have the right to protect themselves, have the right to own firearms, and it's a constitutional infringement for them to say, no, you can't carry a gun on campus. There are rules in place for a reason, and we don't always agree with those rules. But people ask, hey Kyle, what can we do to change those rules, change those laws? And what I always tell people is to mobilize. Join groups like Turning Point USA, Young Americans for Liberty, and put pressure on your lawmakers. Tell them this is not okay, and I have a right to, I have a right to the Second Amendment, and you saying I can't own a firearm or bring it into the dormitories or carry my firearm in class is unconstitutional, and I want to see that change. So you guys need to mobilize and start sending letters to your politicians. Start showing up at the Capitol when they're in session. Start testifying for bills. It's, it's really crazy. I don't want to see a lot, all these young, innocent college students fall victim because the university doesn't care about them. There are so many great um, law enforcement members out there who are protecting us every single day, but we cannot bring a cop with us everywhere we, single, everywhere we go. That's just impossible. We have these blue boxes that around the campus, we've all seen them. You push that button, it calls the police, and you get connected to a dispatcher. How long does it take for a cop to show up, though? When somebody's trying to kidnap you or, or somebody's threatening your life, is that the quickest option to be able to protect yourself? A single button with an officer who could be on a call and your closest person to come help you is five, 10 minutes away? That's not okay, and I want to see that changed. And I'm hoping here at Kent State, you guys mobilize and put pressure on your politicians and your school boards and say, hey, I want my rights back. So we'll dive back into that in a little bit at the end, but all, you, you guys are all here to hear my story. Um, so I want to dive into my story a little bit. I'm not going to get too much into depth, but on August 25th of 2020, we all know what was going on around the country. There was a um, police shooting uh, two days prior, August 23rd, uh, involving Jacob Blake. <coughs> Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back by law enforcement as he was trying to stab the police officer behind him. If, if you guys didn't watch the video, um, you can slow it down and you can see him swinging behind him and trying to stab Officer Shesky. Uh, and that sparked outrage. I get it, it looked bad. All the facts weren't out there. Nobody really knew what happened. You just see a guy getting shot seven times. People were upset. They protested, which is okay. It is okay to protest. I encourage protesting. What I am not okay with is rioting, and they rioted. They burned that city to the ground. They set car lots on fire. They set mattresses stores on fire, and it was upsetting. I remember, I remember the smoke. I remember smelling the smoke and seeing the ash and the, um, the clouds of smoke and the orange glowing sky at night. It was a crazy time. And that was like four years ago. And it felt like it was centuries ago because of how bad it was. We were all victim to that. Our communities were devastated and it was just lawlessness. And I'm really hoping to never see that type of lawlessness again. But we have politicians who are infringing on people's rights, but also letting um, illegal immigrants in through the border. They're not doing anything about the Hamas terrorist group that's out there causing harm on coming into the U.S. and is going to cause harm on us. We don't see anything about that because our politicians do not care about us. 
So to dive back into my story a little bit, I went to Kenosha to provide first aid and help people. I was working August 24th as my job at my job as a lifeguard in Pleasant Prairie at the Rec Plex. Um, I worked, I went to my buddy Dominic Black's house and stayed the night, the night of the 24th. And then we woke up in the morning and we said, hey, let's go clean some graffiti. So we went around town, we cleaned up some graffiti and helped out some businesses. And while we were walking around, we met the owners of this business called Car Source. Um, his name was Sam and we talked to him for a little bit. And <coughs> He um, asked us to come out and help protect his business, and we said okay. Um, then we went back to Dominic's house, hung out for a little bit, and got another phone call from somebody by the name of Nick Smith. Nick called us up, and he was like, "Hey, Kyle. Hey, Dominic. Can you come help protect this car lot business? And by protect, like put out fires and provide first aid." Me and Dominic said okay, so we. Um, got in the car, we went to Nick's house. I had this bulletproof vest that I gave to Nick because I was doing medical aid that night. And I had my long rifle. And we went there um, at around five, six o'clock, provided first aid. I was pepper sprayed. We were tear gassed by law enforcement. And there was this guy who threatened to kill me. His name was Joseph Rosenbaum. He said, if I catch you alone, I'm going to effing kill you. He caught me alone. Mr. Rosenbaum chased me down, cornered me, and left me defenseless. This is a man who said, if I catch you alone, I'm going to kill you, and is now chasing me down. I was absolutely terrified. He was hiding behind the, the corner of this Duramax, waiting for my arrival, with this guy Josh Siminski in front of me, and Josh Siminski takes a step towards me and he's armed with a gun. I try to run back towards law enforcement because I knew where they were at. And then Mr. Rosenbaum comes out from hiding, awaiting this ambush, and starts chasing me, leaving me nowhere else to run. So I start running um, past Josh Siminski until I couldn't run anymore. I'm running, I'm running. He throws something at me. There's a gunshot behind me from Josh Siminski who just shot at me. And I look at Mr. Rosenbaum and I, I address him, I point my gun at him, and that doesn't deter his threat, that doesn't stop him from coming at me. He continues to run. He kept chasing me until I had literally nowhere to go. There were about 200 people on the other side of these vehicles where I was cornered in. There's these four vehicles lined up in a straight line and then like five or six vehicles behind me and I was in between those four vehicles with the guy who threatened to kill me now ripping my gun out of my hand trying to steal it from me so he could try to kill me with it. That's when I defend myself against him. I shot him four times and he passed away. Mr. Rosenbaum was a deadly threat that said if he catches me alone he's going to kill me. I was alone and he was trying to take my gun from me and I exercised my right to defend myself. just the beginning. There was now a crowd of rioters calling for my execution. Imagine being 17 years old and being chased by an angry mob of hundreds of people saying get him and kill him. It was terrifying. I remember time just slowing down and just running trying to get to the police line. I'm running there and I'm trying trying my best to get to safety. That wasn't possible. You guys, you guys may remember this guy by the name of Gage Groshkowitz. He's actually here today, ironically. Um, he decided to come counter-protest me. Um, he drove six and a half hours for this, by the way. <laughs> um, he comes up to me and he is asking, where are you going? I tell him I'm going to the police. You can see the flashing red and blue lights in the back. I can see the flashing red and blue lights. I'm getting closer and closer. I'm almost there. It was impossible to get, possible to get there. I continue to run. And then Mr. Huber. Mr. Huber comes in for his first attack. As I'm running, he hits me in the back of the head with this skateboard, this heavy skateboard with these steel trucks on them. He just drives it into the back of my skull and it hurt. It hurt really bad. 
and then immediately after I was hit in the back of the head by a hard object from a guy in this white white beater. We were never able to identify him. That caused me to stumble and hit the ground. As I'm on the ground, I have several people around me um, coming in to try to kill me. I, I address all those people and I point my rifle in their direction and they back off, every single one of them. None of them got shot, besides one person. One person did not back off. And this is Jump Kick Man, the unidentified, uncomplaining witness, as Mark Richards said in the trial. Jump Kick Man. He comes and he doesn't stop. I am pointing my rifle at him and he keeps coming. He is coming at me with these giant boots with a flying kick to the center of my face. And I'm scared if I'm knocked out, I'm going to be killed. So I fire two shots at him and I miss. The fight was not over then. The fight was just just starting again. Because immediately after that, Mr. Huber, the guy who hit me in, this, in the head with the skateboard already, was coming in for a second attack. This time I'm on the ground, and Mr. Huber comes in. He drives his knees into my chest. He's grabbing my gun, ripping it away from me. But he drives his skateboard into the back of my head again. As hard as he could, he drives this skateboard right here, almost knocking me unconscious, and that's when I defend myself from him. It was one of the scariest situations I've ever been in. I've never had somebody threaten to kill me. I've never been chased down by a mob of rioters. I've never been hit in the back of the head with a skateboard. I've never been kicked in the face. And I was 17 years old. It was. It was surreal. I couldn't believe that this was happening. I was terrified. I thought, this is it. This is where I die. Thank God I'm still alive here to share my story. Because they really wanted to kill me. And it makes a lot of these, I'm going to, it makes a lot of these leftists upset that I'm coming to these universities to share my story. And all I can say to them is, co Parker. <laughs> After Mr. Huber, it wasn't over. Mr. Grosskreutz, you guys remember him? I was telling you guys a couple minutes ago that he's actually here today. Um, this guy who asked where I was going, who I told I was going to the police, who knew I was going to the police, who saw me on the ground, who saw me get hit in the head with a skateboard, who saw me get kicked in the face, and saw me defend myself drew a Glock handgun. He pulls this handgun and he's coming after me. He has his gun pointed directly at my head. I remember just the time freezing and just staring down the barrel of that gun and then I point my gun at him. He lowers his gun, so I lower mine. As I lower my gun, Mr. Grosskreutz comes back in to execute me. He even said it. He wishes he could have killed me. We have messages to prove that. We're able to show that he's posted on social media that he wishes he would have killed me. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to put a bullet in the side of my head. <coughs> I defended myself from him and I hit him in the bicep and that he was no longer a threat. He backed off after that. The fight was, the first fight was over. I got up, there was a guy directly in front of me, I addressed him, he backed off, and I was able to get to the police line. I get to the police line, and I walk up to this police cruiser, there's two guys in there, and I'm trying to tell them what happened. Um, there's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of yelling, there's a lot of smoke in the air. Their adrenaline was pumping, my adrenaline was pumping. I try to tell them what happened. I say, I just shot somebody. And then they, they tell me to go home. I was shocked by that. I was shocked. I just told them I just shot somebody. And they said, go home, get out of here. And then they pepper sprayed me. <laughs> so, I went ahead and I, I went home. I went home to my house in Antioch, Illinois. I then met with my family and then I turned myself into the Antioch Police Department. And I was held in jail for 87 days and put on trial. And that goes into the second battle, the legal battle. 
And I like to think of it as there's three battles. You have the initial battle of protecting your life and defending yourself. And then you have the second battle, which is the legal battle of going through all of these legal issues, um, being put on trial for defending yourself. And then I'll, I'll dive into the third issue after this. So I turn myself into the police. I'm Mirandized. I take five. I invoke my Fifth Amendment rights. I'm arrested. I'm held in jail for 87 days. Not sure how many of you guys have been to jail in this crowd, but the food sucks. Would not recommend it. I'm, I'm in there. I, um, I'm kind of scared. I'm in this room by myself, practically 24 hours a day. I was at Debke Juvenile Detention Center until October 30th of 2020, and then I was extradited back to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where I was at Kenosha County Jail until November 19th when I was bailed out. At Debke Juvenile Detention Center, I was mostly held in solitary confinement, but there were times where I was allowed out of my cell. So the rules were, I had to have a guard with me at all times. So I would go out and I would mingle with the other inmates and I got really good at playing spades. Um, that's the one thing I could take out of jail. Don't go to jail and I learned how to play spades. After I get bailed out, I get picked up by the security team and um, we have McDonald's, we go back to our safe house in Indiana and the trials process starts. I'm going to weekly meetings with my attorney, Mark Richards. We're coming up with a game plan. We're going through um, all these mock trials, preparing for this, um, preparing for the trial, and just going through all this discovery and just figuring out the best action. So we get prepared. We have all these meetings. I wasn't doing any media appearances. I didn't even have a cell phone for most of that time. I was on trial. Um, yeah, imagine being 18 years old without a cell phone. Um, we went, we went to trial, and it was hard. We, during that process, we hired somebody by the name of Joanne Demetrius, and so, she, so Joanne is a jury, con, uh, a jury consultant, a jury consultant. She represented O.J. Simpson for his murder trial. So it's just a strange fact about Joanne, but she's really good. She's a patriot and we were able to get a fair and unbiased jury. And we went to court, and I remember just waking up every single day, not knowing if this is gonna be my last day as a free man, and that was a lot to carry at 18 years old. I woke up, and one of the things that really helped me cope, and this goes into a little bit of the third battle, is the mental fight. So you have your legal battle, uh, you have your, the, the self-defense that occurred, your first battle, the legal battle, and then your mental fight, focusing on your mental health. And Milo, the dog who's up here on stage with me today, I got him a couple, like a couple weeks after I was bailed out of jail. And he's been with me ever since. I've had him since he was eight weeks old. And this dog has helped me through a lot with PTSD and um, just like being a good dog. I remember just waking up every morning, going outside and throwing the ball with him, then getting in the security vehicle and going down to court, coming back, and then just decompressing because trials take a lot out of you, especially when you're the defendant. We we get to uh, November, um, we get to, I think it's November 20th, and this is the final day of jury deliberations. It's around noon, we get a call from the clerk and say, hey, the jury has reached a verdict. I was so nervous. I went into the bathroom, I vomited, because I didn't know which way this was gonna go. I didn't know if I had a good jury or a jury who was gonna leave me out to rot. So we went out there and I just felt sick. I was exhausted, I was dealing with this, all, all this PTSD from having to relive everything in court, and I was like, is this how I'm gonna spend the rest of my life? The clerk starts reading the verdict. First count, not guilty. Second count, not guilty. Third count, not guilty. Fourth count, not guilty. Fifth count, not guilty. I was a free man. I was so thankful that the jury got it right because there's so many circumstances um, to where the jury hasn't got it right. We look at Eric Chauvin or we look at um, Daniel Perry in uh, Texas. 
Daniel Perry um, was a man who had an AK-47 pointed at him, and he shot the guy in self-defense, and he was convicted by a rogue DA in Travis County. Uh, Governor Abbott has pledged to pardon him, but in the state of Texas, it's very complicated. You have to go through the Board of Pardon and Paroles, and then it has to be recommended to the governor. So Mr. Perry is currently going through the Board of Pardon and Paroles, and I'm hoping that they make a recommendation because what would you do if you had an AK-47 pointed at you? And I'm, I just feel so bad because that could have very easily been me. That could have been me with a bad jury who convicted me. And we see this other case that's just more recent, Nik Nikolai Mio. Um, Corey Sharafasi is one of his attorneys. Corey got me acquitted. Nikolai was just convicted in, uh, he was either Minnesota or uh, Wisconsin. And you watch the videos, you have these kids calling him a pedophile and doing all these things, and he was just looking for a cell phone. And then he's surrounded and they're trying to drown him, pushing his face into the water. And he's left with no choice, so he pulls out his knife and he defends himself. I just don't know how a jury, not one juror, could believe that that was self-defense. And I see this and I'm just like, wow. Wow, the world we live in today, our justice system is so messed up. I got lucky, I got a good jury, I got a good judge, but not everybody gets lucky. And it, it's really disheartening to see. I go around to all these campuses and I talk to a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of people who have been in situations to where they have had to defend themselves and what makes me really upset is every single one of them has been sued. I really want to see a law put into place. I've been talking to some politicians trying to figure out how to make this happen but if you are acquitted of self-defense in a courtroom you shouldn't be civilly tried a jury of a higher standard already acquitted you. Why should you have to relive everything that's happened and be sued for a bunch of money? There's a lot of things happening in the US right now. We have this huge Israel and Hamas conflict. We have these Hamas terrorists attacking innocent people. And what re makes me really scared and why I get really upset that um, people, especially young campus um, students, aren't allowed to carry firearms is because I'm scared that what happens if these Hamas Palestinian terrorists come to the U.S. and try to attack us? Are we supposed to be left defenseless? Are you supposed to be left defenseless because you're not allowed to have a gun in your dormitory? And that makes me upset seeing that there are real scenarios that could happen and the government just doesn't care. Your school doesn't care. Law enforcement cares, but there's not a lot that they can do. There's only so many of them. There's so much crime that happens around this world and Kent State doesn't have a lot of crime. The crime rate out here is pretty low. It's, pretty, it's a pretty safe community. Um, from what I've gathered. But you go to towns like LA or San Francisco or Memphis, and you just see the lawlessness of criminals getting away with everything. And I'll tell you what, none of those guys can legally have a gun. But they're taking the guns away from the good guys. And that that's just something I wanna see change. I think we're gonna roll into a little bit of a Q&A. Um, I think uh, Brady's gonna set that up for somebody. If you guys have any questions that you guys would uh, like me to answer. Um, I'll, I'll try my best to answer them, and if I can't, I'll let you know. Hi. Um, what would you say to protesters out there who accuse you of spreading hate and division? Well, me giving a pro-life speech saying that everybody here has the right to defend themselves and the right to live, I don't know how that's spreading hate. Hey? Hey, uh, glad to hear that the doc's been a major help for you when it comes to mental health. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one was, 
how were you originally introduced to the world of firearms? And second is, do you have any personal favorites when it comes to the Tiger Guns? <laughs> um, I really wasn't introduced to firearms at all as a kid. Um, the rifle I had, I maybe put 500 rounds through. We weren't like a firearm family just recently getting into guns. I carry a Glock 17 um, with the Surefire X300 on it. That's what I carry. <coughs> Kyle, it's a pleasure to see you. I'm very glad you're here. I watched you all the way through your trial. I watched you through your ordeal on those streets, and I'm so grateful to see you here. Thank you. What I wanted to ask you, young man, is not too long ago, I was viciously attacked like you. Totally did not expect it at all. I'm still dealing with the stress of that event. How long? did it take you to get over what happened to you when you were just a kid? I don't really think there's a way of getting over it. I think there's a way of learning how to live with it. And I, everybody's different. Everybody's grief time is um, different. Mine took me a couple of years to get really comfortable to be able to talk about it. And some people are different. It actually helps me a lot. Part of my like therapy plan is talking about it and having my dog and then um, different types of therapy is the best way for, that. that's what worked for me. Hi, do you have any regrets for, from the shooting, the trial, or the aftermath of each? I would say with hindsight being 2020 as it is, if I would have known that I would have been violently and viciously attacked and be put on trial, I wouldn't have gone there. But that does not change my right to self-defense. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here and telling your story. It's extraordinarily important. You showed up with a scrub brush to clean graffiti off of the building that was being vandalized. You showed up with a medical kit because you're a trained lifeguard, you were giving first aid to people, and yet you have been called a white supremacist who is there to kill people at a BLM rally. How do you respond to those people who have no earthly idea what you were actually there to do, which was to help people, even four years later now, you're still being viewed that way by so many of those protesters outside. What do you want to say to them about what you really want there to do? Well, I tried to have a reasonable conversation with some of the people who disagree with me, and honestly, it didn't really go anywhere, so I, I kind of have just let it go. They can say whatever they want. They have a First Amendment right. I know what happened. I know the truth. They can spew the lies all day if they want to. It doesn't affect my day to day. So, again, thank you for coming out. Um, I, myself, I'm 17 years old. I came out here because I wanted to be a part of, kind of, to be a part of this, right? I want to be a part of this community that is supporting each other and upholding our rights. But in this community, Kent State and hundreds of other college campuses across the country, I'm scared of, like, I'm not looking for a fight, right? But our livelihoods, the ideals that we believe in, are under fire every day. And we are often kind of persecuted within the shadows for believing what we do. How can we, again, not looking for a fight, how can we come together as this community of people who are looking to uphold our rights? How do we do that? How do we come together to defend what we believe in? Well, there's a bunch of good groups out there. I, I talked about it a little bit in my speech about getting involved. Uh, with that question, that's a great question, but getting involved honestly and joining organizations like Turning Point USA, Young Americans for Liberty, volunteering for a good um, candidate's uh, campaign. I know I volunteer for a candidate out in Texas where I live and I go electioneering and door knocking with him. And doing things like that, that's probably the best bet. 
and just making politicians afraid again because they're way too afraid. Um, they're way too comfortable with being in that office and they need to be, to be afraid and know that they can be removed at any given time. Yeah. Hi, I had a question. Before the events happened, you made a very, very important decision and you didn't touch on it here, but that decision was when you purchased your sling. And because of that, they were unable to take those firearms from you. I went out and bought as many slings as I could during COVID because of what <laughs> happened to you. Could you touch on that, on that decision and what went into that decision? Because I think that was really, really uh, a smart decision and it played dividend, paid dividends. Well, there wasn't much thought that went into me purchasing this sling. I was doing first aid that night and I really didn't want to leave my rifle on the ground when I was helping somebody. So I was like, hey, I'll buy a sling so I can just throw it behind me or have it dangling in front of me. Hey Kyle, I just truly want to thank you for being here tonight and uh, being part of the Second Amendment movement. Uh, my question to you tonight is, uh, did you or do you have the opportunity to sue those, including the fake news media, who continually oh, attempts yes. to paint them? Unfortunately, with a bunch of laws regarding defamation, it's near impossible for me to come after any of these news organizations. I am, however, countersuing Gage Grossgroots, the guy who put a gun in my face. Um, why should I protest the rifle and get everyone riled up? Uh, riled up more knowing that they're upset with police already and then you go with the rifle getting those people riled up thinking you're and saying it was self-defense knowing that there's already chaos going on and you go there with a white rifle. Your question is, me going there with a rifle is asking for trouble. Well, what about all of BLM that was there with rifles? And yes, <laughs> What's riling people up about providing first aid? That's all I got. Next question, please. You know exactly what you have to do. <laughs> My question is, you referenced how there's no violent crime taking place surrounding Kent State particularly. Now, I am personally aware of drug crime, oh, there's crime drugs everywhere. And, and traffic crime, significant traffic crime like DUIs. Now, uh, this is a two-part question. In liberal communities, what do you think the correlation is between those drug and traffic crimes to violent crime, and as a Christian, what do you think the appropriate solution should be? Well, the correlation I see, especially with these um, low-level drug crimes, is we have these people who are coming into these cities who are doing all these drugs and then getting released by these Soros-funded DAs who are easy on crime, but then they're going out because, hey, I got, a, got away with selling drugs, and then they end up committing more violent, more serious felonies or um, end up ODing or robbing somebody because they need money for dope. And I think that's the correlation. And I think we, as a Christian, I don't think we need to be easy on crime. I think we're easy enough as, as is on crime. I think if you break the law, you need to go to jail. And I don't think we should be easy on sentences. I don't think we should be lenient with undercharging them. Or I think we should, I think they deserve due process. I think they have a constitutional right to a trial of jury their peers, but if they're convicted, the judge should put them in prison for an appropriate amount of time. And then I, I really do think rehabilitation is a necessary step that our prisons do not offer. Addiction is overtaking this country. We see the fentanyl crisis and the heroin um, addictions around the country. And what help is there for them? There's not much out there helping these people outside of putting up more injection sites or handing out free needles to them. That doesn't solve drug abuse, that creates a...
for schedule reasons, this is going to be our last question for the night. Thank you, everybody. Kyle, you mentioned some of the policy goals you're trying to get passed after that. Has there been any politicians or public figures that have been particularly helpful in doing so? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not going to name any names because it's, it is a project I am working on that um, is hopefully going to get passed the next session. Um, but there are a couple politicians I'm working with on introducing a law to where if you defend yourself and you're acquitted criminal, you can't be civilly charged.